What is up, YouTube hey gang? Thank y'all for tuning back into the shenanigans family. Today, it's been a while since we've been on the side of the world. Um, we dropping back into some Formula One racing. Remember, we was real big on watching these, cra but we was watching crashes. So y'all had us watching crashes. Speaking of that, so I just watched for the first time with our son. He's watched it before, but we officially watched Gran Turismo, the movie. It's a great movie. And I was like... Great movie. And was I was game. in I my the game feelings. All the time. I Me played... too. I used to play with my brothers and stuff, and I didn't even know they made a movie. Because I was thinking of Gran Torino. And then he's like, no, it's Gran Turismo. And I was like, oh my God, I remember playing this. A great movie. If you haven't seen it, go to watch it. And I was in my feelings, it's and he good. was just like, why are you crying? Movie. I said, this movie is sad, but it's really good. So go watch it if you haven't. But it just made me think of it because we were talking about that. Cars, GT cars, prototypes, stock cars, and super bikes. Different racing disciplines produce very different machines, all with different strengths and weaknesses. But how do they stack up? Which would win in a quarter mile drag race or a top speed run? Or the biggest question I have is which would win in a race around a circuit? We've done some calculations to find out. So firstly, we should run through the cars, starting with Formula One. Our I would think the Formula One. I'm gonna take a guess, y'all. Before have we dive in, I would think. I don't. I don't know a lot about racing, like but that. I would think the Formula One would probably be the fastest because it's light. It's a little car, and then I'm thinking the motor is super. But I could be wrong. But I would think the Formula One would probably come in. Like I would. I don't think nobody messing with that. But I don't know. Thousand horsepower and weight around 800 kilograms in race trim. But as we know, they're tuned for maximum corner speed with lots of downforce. And so this may hinder it in a straight line, <laughs> but pay dividends around the lap. Next is Formula 2 with very similar weight, but with less aero and less power, with around 620 horsepower. Then we have its baby brother, the Formula 3 car. This has less power, but much less weight. Then we have IndyCar, Formula 1's American cousin. Similar in weight to a Formula 1 car, but with a bit less power. However, they are much more slippery in a straight line. Then we have Formula E, much less power than other Formula cars, more weight, but instant torque. These mm. are very much designed for smaller, twistier like street design circuits. On the design on and that's our lot for Formula cars, next to the GTs. So we have the three classes that will be racing at Le Mans this year. The new hypercar with a hybrid system powering all four wheels it has around 670 horsepower. Then there's LMP2, very close behind with 600 horsepower and similar weight. Then there are the GTE cars, which have 550 horsepower and weigh around 1200 kilograms. On the face of it, they look very similar to our next competitor, the GT3 car, but they're made to be extremely slippery for the long straights at Le Mans. The GT3s have a little less power than the GTEs, but have much more aero, and so might not be far off in terms of lap time. Then comes the DTM cars, the German Touring Car Championship. These are actually very similar to GTEs, so we'll see how they stack up. Then we have NASCAR, which are obviously designed with ovals in mind, but are racing on many more road circuits in recent years. And then finally, we have MotoGP. They have incredible power to weight ratios, but may lose out around the corners as there's much less rubber on the road when compared to a race car. And the first test is a 0 to 100 kilometers an hour. It wraps up the car's traction, power, torque, and weight all in one test. However, most cars actually aren't great at this. For example, a modern Tesla could give a Formula One car a good run for its money. What? Race cars tend to have very small, light clutches that aren't particularly good at launching. But anyway, what do you think will win? Obviously, no one has done this combination in real life, so we've stacked them up in the virtual world and compiled all of their times to see which would come out on top. You know what? I for sure thought, like, it's me it's thinking, I would think the bike too. Like, I would think the bike, but I, I, obviously the bike did not come. It's a digital version. <laughs> uh, I love that. I'm going to get the game. It's it giving me like an arcade game right now. No, it literally, it did. Remember, you know, in the, um, I think in the, um, the fairs, you know, the little horse ones? Yes. That's literally what it gave me. I like stuff like this because, like, when I'm not familiar with stuff, like, racing, like, when, when it's entertaining and then you find, like, stuff about it, like, it's, it's, it's something that's, inner, like, you want to learn it. Like, I, like, when we showed us the crashes and, like, seeing how these cars work, I was impressed. Like, we reacted. If you haven't seen it, we react to a few of them. But this is impressive. Like, the people who drive these machines and how fast they go. I feel like we have to show it to our son. Like, it, it's crazy. Because he's really into cars and stuff like that, and he'll be mind blown. 
The winner is actually pretty surprising. The fastest is the hypercar. It may weigh the more hypercar? and have less power than a Formula One car, but its hybrid system powers all four wheels, giving it incredible acceleration off the line. And another key factor is power to weight, and this is why you see the MotoGP mm, bike doing like well. Bike, yeah, it doesn't get a great start due to reduced traction, but it does have a better power to weight ratio than anything else here. So once the but traction bike is right down, there, nearly 1200 horsepower per ton powers it to actually beat the Formula One car. Now, powerful bikes do tend to be really hard to launch, but once they're off the line, the acceleration is incredible. Dude, bike flipped. Did you did you ever play that one game? It was like a motorcycle game, but it had like lights and the tires and stuff. It was, it's a game. I Tron. remember playing. Huh? Tron. The movie I, they made on it. I, I yeah, it's an older, movie. it's an old arcade game. Tron. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I was just thinking. I was like, that's. You never seen the movie? No, I didn't even know they had a movie. Some I don't. I, uh, okay. You have watched it. I watched it. Tron. Yes. You probably didn't pay attention. It's a good movie. Start paying attention. That's your problem. You see, you talking about stuff, but you now it's not a good movie. But you play the game. The Formula E car does really well in this test, game. beating many cars with much more horsepower. But that instant torque from the electric motor must make up for it. The gaps between the rest of the pack is actually really close, with the GT3 and the NASCAR bringing up the rear, as they have significantly more weight the than the others in this right test. For me, the most surprising is the hypercar. You would expect the power and reduced weight of the Formula One car to give it the edge but this initial acceleration is what the hypercars are best at. Up to 200 kilometers an hour, the hypercars have the advantage in a one-on-one -on -one race. But if we let them carry on, this is where the power to weight is less of an issue and the aerodynamic drag versus power becomes a bigger part of the test. This is where the F1 car really takes over. You can see that the extra power helps it claw back the time and accelerate up to a top speed of 360 yeah. kilometers an hour, where the hypercar falls short at 335. That's crazy how the science too goes behind this because like being not like, you know, what do you call it? Knowledgeable in this, like you would think, oh, this car got the most horsepower, it's, it's definitely gonna win. But you gotta think of the aerodynamics, the weight, the way they built the dang car, like the wind going through. Like to know all this goes into the like to make a race car it's crazy. Like coming up as a kid, you think, oh yeah, just horsepower, horsepower. Yeah. Like these this science behind this stuff. Like it is crazy, it's mind blowing the science that go like one little curve in the car can change how the wind hits it. And it's nuts, it's nuts. If we let all of the others reach their top speeds, there are some interesting results. This is essentially oh, a measure wow. of power versus drag. And at these speeds, the force produced go. by slicing through the air is immense. Also, many of these cars are tuned for lap time on short tracks. And so top speed isn't massively relevant, but it's interesting to see anyway. The top speed is actually taken by IndyCar which has less power than the Formula One car, but thanks to its very slippery body and covered rear wheels, it can reach up to 380 kilometers an hour. The MotoGP bike actually beats the Formula One car due to its much smaller frontal area. The bike still hits a smaller though. Hole the bike in the is still going. It also no, doesn't create any downforce, something that comes with a large drag penalty. The LMP2 car beats the Formula 2 car, but more interestingly, it also beats the Hypercar, a car that is a class above it in the World Endurance Championship. The margins between these two classes are really small this year. It'll be interesting to see the lap time difference between these two, where the hypercar dominates the acceleration zone, but the LMP2 car is actually faster at the end of the straight. But acceleration and top speed is one thing. Lap time around a circuit is a whole different ball game. The cars often take different approaches to the trade-off between straight line speed and corner and grip. And we've picked Spa as the track for this battle, as the majority of cars have raced here and set representative laps in the past couple of years. And obviously Lewis Hamilton holds the lap record here from 2020 with a 1 minute 41.2, which is quite clearly the yeah. fastest car here over a lap. The fastest lap in a Formula 2 car is held by Yuki Tsunoda with a 157.6, over 16 seconds slower than the Formula 1 car. And the fastest Formula 3 lap was 7 seconds slower than this with a 2 minutes 5. We also know all of the WEC times from the nuts. 6 hours of Spa this year, so let's add them in there too. That is nuts to think. And I don't even know how big these laps are, but to think like a car is making around there in a minute and some change, like that is beyond me. Like, can it's you imagine being in that car? Like everything is probably just... Like it's a, it's, it's for like sure when blur. they say, yeah, I was gonna say it's like when they say when you're in a bike and you're but going they to say, and everything right here is like so blurry. They say it's crazy that like uh that sometimes like it's so fast that everything's kind of moving slow because you're going so fast. Like it's like it's like choo, that's like creepy, picture. That's what they say. But I can see it. That imagine DTF. like driving a normal car after you drive that. It don't feel the same. You it, like, I'm like what I is can't. This power? What is, you hit the gas. What is this power? This is nothing. <laughs> 
M and GT3s have also raced this track, but what's more difficult to predict is NASCAR, MotoGP, and Formula E. As many of you will know, these cars don't race this track, and so finding data for this has been really tricky. So what we've done is compare these cars using other circuits lap times. So for example, NASCAR raced at the Circuit of the Americas this year with Tyler Reddick set in a lap of 2 minutes 12.6. Two minutes? And then the last Formula One time was set by Charles Leclerc in 2019 with a pole time of 1 minute 36.1. Like it gets lower if and If you work this out, it turns out to be a 28% difference. Math. And since Cota and Spa are roughly the same in terms of having long straights as well as many slow to medium speed corners, we can apply this difference to get a NASCAR time of two minutes and nine seconds at Spa. Now this isn't a bulletproof estimate, but it seems to be a pretty good ballpark figure. If we do the same with MotoGP, which has raced at Red Bull Ring, we also get a 28% difference compared to Formula One, meaning we would expect NASCAR and MotoGP to be very close in a race around Spa, and that would be good to watch. Now with Formula E, this gets a bit trickier. They tend to race much shorter tracks in Formula One, and so this guess is a little fuzzier. The Formula E and Formula One times around Monaco have a difference of 23%, but this being a very short stop and start track, this wouldn't be massively representative around Spa, where the long straights would punish the Formula E car. This would make the lap time around two minutes four, which seems much too fast. We would probably expect around a two minutes 10 to two minutes 20. So we went looking for some more data, and interestingly, Jimmy Broadbent has lapped both the Formula E cars and the Formula One car around now the North Shore. Look, look at the outside. This track has long straight, slow corners, and look. everything in between, and North. much more representative of Spa. Interestingly, this percentage comparison works out as exactly a lap time of around two minutes ten. Definitely a ropey estimate, but it gives us a good idea. Formula One may have beaten IndyCar on a circuit, but what would happen if the roles were reversed and they raced on an oval? click here to find out thank you very much for watching and we will catch you in the next one this is actually entertaining wow. like, i feel like i want to show my son this it, it's crazy it, it's nuts to think like our cars. son likes uh, loves i think that like loves cars and he's the type to break cars down and he will literally spot a car i know exactly right off the back what it is and he was really fascinated by the movie gran turismo so he loved it and i feel like this will actually show him some yeah, more I'm a, knowledge I, upon that i'm a fox body man you know never raced for real. In his mind. No, nah, but I, 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 I'm, we got one right now. Me and my son are going to build. I built one before. Built another one. Um, fun. But racing is fun. This is a different level of racing, though. This is a different level of building and, and science behind it. Like, I couldn't even... Break it down. Gather or even try to attempt what they were talking about. It just goes to show you, like, how cool it is for other people when they find this to be their career. And it's just like, dang, like, that's actually that science really is cool. The science like, that's when they say, like, when, when you know, you know those students in class, they'd be like, I'm never going to use this math. Them kids were like, yes, I am. <laughs> yes, I am. And they're using it till this day in their careers. But this, this was dope to see, like, to see these top cars go against each other and see the times and oh, who you I thought a Formula One definitely was gonna win or I didn't even think I forgot I didn't about even the know bike. there was this many race cars to be honest. Me either. I thought it was just one Formula One. Now it was Formula E, Formula Two, Formula Three. Like I just got educated, y'all. Learn something new every day, they say, yes. right? Good job. That Learn good something one. new every, every day. day. See? Good. But as always, if y'all got some more content y'all want us to react to like this and y'all like this, make sure y'all get this Let video a like. Know. Drop your suggestions down below. We'll see you guys on the next journey.